David Bromley, great to have you here at Jarrah Galleries. Thank you, it's, it's wonderful to be here. David, tell me, when did you first realise you were destined to be an artist? Um, I think it was in my mid-twenties, maybe my late-twenties, um, after a, uh, a, a very, very rocky adolescence and early adulthood, I, um, I was realised that it was not any port in the storm um, that I should be looking for, but a sort of really articulate way of getting involved in something um, that I think I could call, you know, my, um, you know, purposeful life. Um, and uh, I became a potter, which I think served me as a bridge towards painting. Um, hi, darling. Um, um, and um, I think that, um, I think that um, it, it, I would not have been able to go into painting straight away because I think it was too, uh, the thought, yes, I, darling? I'm looking for my mum. Did you see her? I know exactly where she is. I think she's in the bedroom with Babel trying to put her to sleep. So when you go in there, you'll be very quiet. See you, darling. So I think that um, my, I, I, I never would have imagined that the word artist, you know, I just, I wasn't that sort of, you know, it, it, that was like a dream, like an, a fairy tale or something. So, you know, I didn't even know who Vincent van Gogh was. I knew of painters, of course, but not, really anything about them or where they fit or anything and I think you know being surrounded by the sort of people that I were you know I became a sign writer you know I washed cars I was a postie it's it, it just too exciting and too amazing but becoming a potter was a little bit more like a um, you know a trade or a craftsperson or a woodworker or something and uh, but once I started that you know I was down the slippery slope and then, you know, things like painting and sculpting and stuff, you know, they came into my sights as something that was possible. So, how did you so make, late twenties, I think. How did you make the actual transition from a potter to a painter? Um, I, I, as I was a, um, a sign writer at 15, um, I, had, I had some brushmanship. Um, I used to, people say to me that they're not surprised that I'm an artist and that I was always very creative. You know, I mean, I used to paint all over my cars and, you know, I'd do pictures of Big Jagger on, you know, my dashboards and, you know, I used to paint all my bedroom walls and stuff. But to me, that was more, I don't know, I think that was m more about madness or, you know, I, I, it, it, yeah, as I said, it just wasn't in my sort of, you know, f field of thought. So, you know, I, I, I used to, I used to do show card writing. So I used to, so, you know, I, I had a brush in my hand, a reasonable amount. I probably even had some old brushes from that. So when I started making pots, I used to paint on them using oxides and things like that. So um, it, it, I had a surface um, to work in. Um, I was on the dole um, and I used to take my money that I sold my pots from and take it off the dole. So I used to say, get a job. And I thought, well, I've sort of got half a job. You know, I'm telling you what I sold at the market on the weekend, but I, I reckon the person in the Sunshine Coast where you used to go and get your doll check from, he had an art supply place next to him and I was making pots. And so I said to him, how do you use the paints and things? And he said, um, well, I used to stretch for my aunt, you know, my uncle in Europe or something. He taught me how to stretch paper and do all of those sorts of things. And I said to him, Oh, you know, I'm just intrigued, but have you got some really cheap paint and stuff? He said, don't use um, cheap paint, you know, use good quality paint and good quality materials because you might do something good. And I'm like, ooh, I might do something good. Wow, that's a, that's, you've planted a thought. I just thought I'd sort of push this stuff around. Isn't it funny how someone just says that one little thing, like you might do something good. I mean, I came from a situation where I don't think I'd done anything good or anyone would really praise me for anything. So it was pretty cool to, for that even to be a consideration. And uh, 
but I think I've always had probably one of the greatest attributes you can have as a creative person, and that's stubborn. So once that thought even had been put in my mind that I could do something good, I started chasing that. So What are your greatest inspirations? Um, my family. Um, yeah, probably just about sort of starts and finishes there. It, it, it's it's a it, you know it's, some artists will say um, you know my art comes first. You know it to, to, you know to me uh, you know I've I've always saw a, a certain sort of. Um, you know, a, a meaning and to me. I'm just old school. You know, I just like home and my family, and you know, having my family around and stuff. So that's the main thing. My greatest, I suppose, driving creative force outside of that um, is to make things. Um, again, I think I'm pretty old fashioned. I'm the sort of guy that would go in the shed, you know, you know, with bits of wood and knock them together and stuff. I like making things. I like doing things with my hand. I like creating. And I'd probably say, you know, the, the, like the Pink Floyd song, you know, shine on you crazy diamond. You know, I love people who just can't be told that you can't do something or you can't achieve something. And I think I've just always loved people who um, just despite, um, you know, certain playing fields not being the automatic ones that you would take, you know, being a creative or being a painter or being a musician or I just love all those crazy diamonds that don't know the word can't and, you know, they just keep, you know, striving for something and then obviously you've got all your er different eras in one of my areas because, you know, I obviously do different things in different creative areas but in the, you know, painting, you know, um, sculpting um, area, you know, the, the, you know, the people that suddenly turned everything on their heads, like the Picassos and the Pollocks and the Van Goghs and stuff, you know, you read, you know, the Warhols, you read their stories and things and, you know, people say, you know, you march to the tune of, what is it, you, the beat? It's not a beat, it's a bloody symphony, isn't it? It's an orchestra of, you know, different eclectic sounds that all combine to, a, to, to, to make these people just walk these amazing paths and, um, you know, I, I think they're the ones that inspire me. You know, I just hate words like can't and, um, you know, you shouldn't or what if. And, uh, you know, they're the ones that inspire me. And I, I don't, it doesn't really matter what the material is, but if, you, if you're just willing to take things probably that bit further, um, and then just do it every day. The combination of all of those things adds up to, well, you either fail catastrophically, you know, or, you know, you exceed in exciting yourself in an adventure that, you know, the path less trodden or whatever, and I just love those people. The crazy diamonds, yeah. Who influences your work? Um, I'd say probably... <laughs> I, I think I, I have so many interests. You know, I love cars, I love motorbikes, I love gardening, I love architecture, I love art, I love films, I love poetry, I love, I love fashion, I love materials, I love timber, I love rock, I love sunsets, I love... There's a, there's a, there was a great Australian artist, I think he originated from Canada, but he spent a lot of time in Australia, a guy called Ian Fairweather, and ended up in Bribey Island in Queensland, and I think the Tate Museum Tate found him and he was a very sort of unusual hermit-like man and I think the Tate Museum had a trophy for him um, it was like an art trophy to say you're an amazing and remarkable world artist and he hid in the bushes and stuff they finally found him and he's sitting there and you know he's got this trophy and you know it, it, they said to him what influences you and he said well of course everything I've ever seen and everything that I've ever done so yeah, I think that, yeah. Tell us about this amazing workspace and your studio. Um, I'm a romantic. Um, as a kid, I was definitely one of those kids that was always, you know, under the covers with a torch, um, you know, reading till, you know, one o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday. 
um, you know, looking at the dust in the, um, sun, you know, sun streaming in the bedroom, you know, window. I would have read Grimm's fairy tales a million times, you know, every science fiction thing, you know, every, you know, I, I started to read all the classics and I just read and I read and I read. And when I reached the stage, you know, in my early 20s where basically you could have thrown away the key, I was that removed from anything applied in my life um, and, you know, virtually no friends and everyone just thought that I was a complete an utter loser, which I suppose in many ways, um, you know, I, I, I was. When I started to paint, um, you know, I would get books on artists and they to me were, you know, I suppose some people would, you know, apply for art school or do high school art, um, you know, and then apply and so they would have some knowledge or something to hang their hat on. Um, you know, I did like, I think I started to realise that I had actually liked people like Rene Magritte and, and stuff. But I, when I started to um, read about these artists, um, it, 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 that was my sort of like lesson. And so I dreamt up this thing that every artist basically had to have this amazing atelier or, you know, I'd see photos of their places and, you know, you'd see Miro's studio or Picasso's studio and I'm like, awesome, okay, so you've got to have this really cool studio and, you know, you've got to be really opinionated and there's all of these things I put together but I always sort of thought, you know, the studio was the, you know, at all. It was a place where you dreamt. It was a place where, you know, other parts of the world went away and I've always sort of strived for that. I, when I first started as a potter, um, I... I was living in the um, Sunshine Coast in Queensland and I used to throw my pots under a tree. Um, so I just put an extension cord outside and I'd go under a tree and then I'd drive about 50 kilometres to a kiln with all my uncooked um, pots um, in it. And it, it, I think, you know, basically f from, from there, I think I built a little shed um, next to the flat that I was living in and I put my wheel and I think I put a kiln and a chimney in that but I've just slowly stepping stoned with this idea that um, you know you're stu I, I also was very uh, highly concerned when I would meet artists and they'd talk about this um, you know artistic block and because I was terrified to ever have a day off in case you know the madness of old and the, the, the sort of um, uh, you know the, the you know the idle hands thing would come to me and therefore you know drive me back into thinking too much about all the things that I shouldn't think about it it, 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 it sort of I thought how do I make sure that I have um, constant inspiration so I would always seek out um, uh, you know ways of making me feel fulfilled and wanting to create and to me the very quality and the vibe of the studio you know be it the music that you play or the environment that you're in um, and you know do, w as soon as I you know would sell a few paintings you know I'd start to find that you know a tin shed and then I'd find an old warehouse and I've lived in all the roughest you know areas with the you know, because sort of like, well, I'd prefer the biggest, maddest shed and, you know, I know it's not safe to go outside, you know, after a certain time of night, but it just, I had my big shed and I didn't really need to go outside. So all of those sorts of things, I've always lusted after it. It's always been one of my main priorities um, thus far. You know, I still don't fly and I don't like boats and I really don't like open spaces, you know, or travelling or going long distances. So I suppose, you know, some people might say, well, your studio is amazing. And I'm thinking, yeah, well, you know, you were in Europe last year or oh, you were in Asia world, or you were, it? it's my world. It's world. And so I put, always put everything into that. Yeah. Um, but I, I, also, I, I also, too, I, I'm an obsessive compulsive person. So I've always sought to sort of put things around me. You know, I just find the maddest things I can, you know. When I was completely broke, when I was younger, I would still collect every day. I'd go to the beach every day and collect driftwood, you know, and I'd just love my prize pieces and I'd stack them everywhere. You know, I mean, I've had, you know, shells. I had no money and couldn't afford paint. So, you know, I'd find old buckets on the beach and stuff and cut them out and that was my colour. So. It's not much difference apart from 
you know, sure. the sort of things that I get now. Um, you know, it's the same obsession, the same obsession, but it is certainly, and I, I think that, you know, the quality of the studio and the, and, and the vibration of the studio and the madness and the thing is all about, you know, the, that sort of triumph of the spirit. And then someone might turn around and say, well, it's okay for you, you know, to have such a nice studio, you know, you've, you know, you know, you're quite successful at what you do and stuff. I'm like, no, I've always had, like people used to come to my flats and say, have you got the same, is your flat the same as mine? How come yours looks so good? You know, I've always just spent a lot of time on my places. I mean, as you said today, you know, it's different every time. I'm, I'm obsessed by pushing it all around. It's, it's a tool to me. to me a typical day in your studio? Um, I think probably I'm a tremendous contradiction. Um, I'm, a trem I'm, a, I'm a huge creature of habit and yet at the same time I have, I have a certain amount of th th things that I've got to do during the day and then over a couple of days and then a week and then a month and I know loosely what they are. Um, you know, my adorable wife sort of tells me two or three times a day, like, you've sort of got to be here then and you've got to do that and, you know, we've got a bit of time out then and then you can work later tonight and do that. So as long as I've got the, the roof, the loose framework, it's like when I said to you before, you know, I'm going to go and have a sleep for half an hour because I know that I can stay awake for a couple more hours because I know I've got three or four hours of painting to do today. As long as I've got the base principles, then I'm loose around that. Like tomorrow I know somewhere where I've got to be for two hours, it might take three. And if it takes three, then I'll have toasted, you so know, So how many cheese. hours does David Bromley sleep every night? Oh, four hours, I reckon. Yeah. But I, but I've, I find formality in the informality. I'll find like, you know, when we finish this, we'll eat the ice cream and strawberries that you bought. Um, and then I'll either watch TV for two hours and then get up for four hours, or I'll go down for three or four hours and then I'll watch TV for a couple of um, hours. But I, I loosely do the same thing over a pattern of two or three days. I garden, I hang out with the family, I paint, and then I interact on creative um, projects. But it's all, it, I'm happier if I can eat at the same place for breakfast, the same place for lunch. Um, you know, do the same sort of things, but and certainly whenever I get a block of time and I go in and, and paint, um, you know, I just think you're just the luckiest person in the world to be able to, you know, it's like just paddling, you know, your surfboard out and just free surfing. Um, it's just a great thing. So as long as I can fit that in, I get very anxious if I can't, because um, I just like to, I like to be at the brush a lot of the time because I just um, I always feel like a sense of urgency to create and to make things I feel like it's my life's work and yeah I feel like there's never enough time yeah what mediums do you use what and what do you like about those mediums um, I was with a guy from China um, on the weekend and, and sort of the week before and he's he's um, he's very much into utilizing um, his intellectual property and the things that he's made and he designs and creates and he makes films and sculptures and stuff and he he um, he was just saying after spending some time with me you know how much time I'm actually creating and and and, and making art I, I, I certainly fully understand you know like Warhol did and how people take their ideas and then they sort of manifest them through you know film or you know concept or philosophy or something like that but I and I love that I love the way you can create something and think of ways that you can portray it and put it out be it fashion or design all those sorts of things so you know I like to think that one of your greatest mediums is this but at the same time as I said from the first outset becoming a potter I think I'm a pretty earthy person 
my motto is sort of like, you know, feet in the dirt and, you know, sort of head in the clouds. And I think that's metaphorically, and I'd say probably the dirt that I like to have my feet in is paint. Um, whilst I love to sculpt and sculpt from clay, I love paper and I love watercolours, but I think probably, I think probably paint when it's mushy and you're standing in it like a pool because you're splashing it around everywhere onto canvas and stuff. Uh, it, it, it's just, it's such incredible freedom. And I think probably, yeah, it's really hard. God, I love it all. I love, I love sculpture, I love paint. I love so many creative um, elements. I love a camera. Yeah, paint's probably my favorite, but there's a lot of things on its tail. Mm. things at the moment and um, I because I, I was quite mad when I was younger um, and you know you can say those things loosely and people sort of wonder about those things I I I really was you know I really had trouble fitting into any sort of you know structure whatsoever from friendship through to work to you know just being able to wake up in the morning I felt odd 24 hours you know a day um, and one of the reasons why I wanted to find a purpose for life um, was I thought that being busy, you know, so I used to surf all the time because I was, uh, you know, I was seeking a wave or I was exercising or whatever. Um, when I'm painting, when I was offered, I think the first time I was offered two exhibitions in a year, I was just more relaxed. You know, whereas most people find that stressful, the more that I've got on, the more relaxed I feel. The more, the more I can't think about, um, you know, floating around in space, um, you know, the better off I am. And that's caused me a lot of problems because I'm always seeking ways to be busy. And I've got everything from, you know, big, you know, creative building developments that where I'm creative advisor and, you know, with designing parks and you know, gardens and rooftop buildings um, through to, you know, some projects where we're, you know, I'm working on um, 40 cars at the moment to sort of strip them all down and use them as canvases. I've got some really big things happening in um, China and, um, and um, I just really means I've got to go in the studio or I've got to be designing or I've got to be doing something every day. So just, I've got a huge amount on and talking about it all is just, it freaks me out. <laughs> in, in what ways would you hope your work impacts people? And are there any messages you're wanting to send through your art? Oh, 100%. Look, I think when I first started um, making art, I had a tremendous naivety. Um, you know, I sort of thought that, you know, maybe they were supposed to look good. You know, maybe art was supposed to look good. And maybe when you put it up on the wall that, you know, people would like it. And then I sort of, you know, got myself some, you know, pretty good galleries and things. And I'd start to, you know, meet people who'd been to art school and, you know, spoke in certain sort of um, conceptual language, philosophical language. And, um, you know, I started to sort of realise that probably if you're going to be taken seriously that you need to speak in via, you know, like speak through your art, you know, through veiled languages and then, you know, I'd use the word like nostalgic and sort of said, well, that's a bit uncool and then decorative, which I've always thought's a really beautiful word, you know, or beauty or, you know, a, a craft, all of these things were bad things. So, um, I'd probably, I'd probably like to think that despite the fact that I was encouraged to, um, you know, to start to destroy those words, I hung on to them because once someone said to me once, you know, like, you know, if you really want to be a serious artist, and I thought, well, I've met some of these serious artists and I seem very happy. I'd like to be, 
you know, I'd like to have a bit of fun and I'd like to play and I'd like to stick with what I thought in the first place. And um, I think that, like, no matter what music I've got into, I've always liked the Beatles. I think they craft a really good pop song. Um, I probably think, you know, I'm not a pop artist like Andy Warhol. It's more like, you know, populist. You know, you like to paint paintings that people like. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, you go to a building site now and everyone's got a radio and, um, you know, they're all listening to music and I just think like music, I think everyone should listen to music and you should have music at work and in your car and I think you should have art everywhere. I don't think art should be as um, rarefied um, as it is. I, I just think, you know, like people have breakfast and people listen to music or people go for a swim or something. I think I, people I should... agree more. Yeah, um, people should make art. <laughs> they should have art. And I, and I hope that people... I'm one person that, you know, probably... You know, probably I've, I've unashamedly tried to make it more populist and I, you know, I hope that that's one thing I achieve. Where do you see yourself in 10 years from now? I think I don't know no I really don't know I, I just take it one day at a time yeah Your works are being exhibited at Jar Rock Galleries at Margaret River for Gourmet Escape, which is all about food. What, by the way, is your favourite dishes? Um, there's one thing that one of my favourite artists in the world is called Alexander Calder. And uh, he said, do you know when a piece of work is um, finished? And someone said, no, I don't. He goes, when it's dinner time. Every, I love so much food. I, I, when I first started making art, I was... Um, trying to look after myself and I went on every sort of diet where you didn't eat milk and didn't eat this and didn't eat that and I probably didn't do that for 10 years I didn't eat a lot of those things and now probably my diet constitutes only the things that I wasn't allowed to eat so I love cheese and I love milk and is that what you said what food do I like what are your favorite dishes everything I if definitely the last meal I'd say it would either be wheat bix or toasted cheese and tomato and I've got a friend who um, cooks me a roast on Sunday night and we always go over to their um, place. I'm, I'm pretty um, basic in my eating, but I love sushi. I just love food. I think about it all the time. How about yeah. on the wine front? The wine front, uh, Pinot Noir, I think. Um, I like something. Um, I'm, uh, I've got to know Heston Blumenthal reasonably well. And um, he's got a, um, is the word a sommelier? He, he, I get on really well with him. He reckons I've got great taste because I just tell him to choose because he's the smart one. <laughs> so yeah, I, well, my favorite wine is getting it from someone who really knows a whole lot more about it than me <laughs> and be finding yourself in that situation. <laughs> well, at some, at some time in the future, we'll have to get you over to see our beautiful Margaret River wine region. Yeah, I've heard that it's utterly remarkable. Thank you so much for your time, David Bromley, and it's a great pleasure to have you at Jarrah Galleries. Thanks very much, it's a pleasure to be there.